uh, the first keynote presentation, we'll have a break. Second keynote Support presentation, and it will be open uh, for socializing and thank you. Director of Leadership Eastside, that's almost what, four or five years. And you know, it's a volunteer organization. Okay? 
Okay, so you know it's hard. It's hard for people to motivate people when they are not, you don't have any, any authority over them. Okay? And leadership inside, like I said, the community leadership program, I invited her because we all here are mostly technical people. Okay? We know science and we know engineering, we know math. What we don't know is, you know, other part of, you know, connecting with people and doing something for the community. Because, you know, now we're a big community on the east side. And as a Maharashtra and Indian community, we've got to do our part of contributing to local, uh, local, you know, services. So I think, I would say that after this is done, if a few of it turned on, you know, we can start join the leadership community, the leadership inside program and, you know, finish up your program, okay? So, Karen, I think I'll, if you're ready, I'll turn it over to you. getting my slides up. Thank you so much, Arun. Yeah, we had a great time together when we were in the program. Uh, so again, my name is Karen Duvall, and I'm the Director of Programs at Leadership East Side. Uh, Leadership East Side is a nonprofit that focuses on, focuses on both leadership development and community development. And I love my job. Uh, I've been with LE going on eight years now. Uh, I get to work with people who care deeply about their communities. I work with brilliant leaders who are leading their communities. And I get to use some of my strongest skills and I get to learn new ones. Uh, so as Arun said, I went to UC Berkeley and got my degree in mathematics. I loved mathematics for, I guess, three main reasons. One, I thought it was so beautiful, I would practically swoon. Uh, two, it held truth like I had never imagined in this somewhat crazy and chaotic, uh, contradictory world. And it was one of the hardest things I ever did. So I could feel my brain getting stronger the longer I did it. Um, so, you know, I'm a junior, I'm a senior, I'm starting to look at graduate schools, and I'm getting my recommendations and all my, my applications filled out and dotting my I's and crossing my T's and, and then uh, the second part of my senior year I realized, oh my god, I missed one of the deadlines. Didn't apply to my graduate school. A couple weeks later, oh my gosh, there's another deadline. And another. And another. And finally, it, I realized I didn't want to go get a PhD in mathematics. That's why they, that's why they never got me in. So, you know, I ended up finding my way, right? I, I with lots of twists and turns and false starts. Uh, but I could have saved myself a lot of pain and a lot of time and a lot of energy had I known who I was just a little bit better and known really what my strengths were and what I needed to work on and what I wanted to do. If I just slowed down a little bit and practiced some personal reflection. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today is personal reflection. So first, what do I mean by reflection? Okay, some of you are going to hate this part already. I mean, taking some time, some dedicated time to sit and think, alone, in the quiet, preferably with a blank piece of paper and a pen or pencil. It's about asking yourself questions. So I'm going to give you a lot of examples, a lot of examples today about reflective questions you could be asking. And the first question that you might be having right now is, do I really have to do this? 
Well, you have to. Bill Gates does. Warren Buffett does. J.K. Rowling does. Most of the leaders of Fortune 500 companies do. When we reflect, we stop to intentionally consider deeply something that we might not otherwise have given much thought to. This helps us learn and to see things that we didn't see before. So this is a quote from uh, a CEO of a Fortune 200 investment firm. It is very easy for someone in my position to be very busy all the time. There's always another meeting I really have to go to. However, that's not what I'm paid to do. It's not my, it is my job to carefully think about the big picture. So what's reflection? It's consciously looking at and thinking about our experiences, actions, and feelings. All facts, things that you actually observe, and then examining them and how we're interpreting them. What stories are we making up about the facts? And then questioning and analyzing those stories in order to learn from them, exploring what is happening from other perspectives, or finding patterns and trends. This will help you better understand the big picture or what's happening from a systems perspective. And that is what leaders do. So there are many, many models that you can use to reflect. There's the what, so what, now what. Very simple, very common. There's uh, using observable facts, analyzing those facts, and then interpreting or evaluating. There's what, and then a series of questions why, you can go online, you will see dozens of different models for reflection. Uh, and it's because you know, everybody, everybody uses it. Um, many of them introduce more self-reflection. So how did you feel during one of these steps? As I said, we reflect by asking ourselves questions. What happened? What was the reaction? the way I reacted, the way others reacted. What did I do? How did I do it? What can I learn from that? What happened at the end? Reflecting on your, pers on your professional practice in this way will make your personal beliefs, values, expectations, and biases more evident to you. This understanding of yourself will help you be more successful since it makes you more aware of the assumptions you might be making automatically or uncritically as a result of your particular worldview. And we all have a very particular worldview. These perspectives are valid. Every perspective is valid, but every perspective is partial. So the skill associated with stepping back and pausing to look, diagnose, and reflect are closely related to those in critical thinking. And I can, I can only imagine most of you here are very good at critical thinking. It requires you to unpack whatever you are focused on and not simply accept what you think automatically, what you read, or what you hear at face value. So I want to turn to a book of wisdom for an example here. How many of you know what that is? It's the pensive from Harry Potter. So when you, when you know pensive, right, you put a thought into the pensive, and then you look at it from above, and you re-see what happened. When you look deep into the pensive, you start by observing the facts, and then you move on from there. By looking closely at what actually happened, you're able to use your critical thinking to spot patterns your patterns, as well as other others, relationships between people, influences, what's influencing who and what and how, and you can see a bigger picture than when you're actually in the action.
Okay, there's another way to think about this. This is sort of a broader type of perspective so that you can see uh, patterns and linkages in entire systems. Uh, imagine your life and one of the systems that you're in as a dance floor. You're in the middle of it, doing your thing with the people around you. Uh, it's through reflection that you can leave that dance floor and your day-to-day -day work and go up to the balcony where you can see the entire system. Right? Who's dancing with who? Who's talking over the corner? Who's sneaking out the back door? Right? Who's eating? Who's sitting? So uh, where, where's activity? Where is not much happening? So that you can see how the system is functioning and where it may not be producing the results that you want. And maybe why it's not producing the results that you want. So you can use this technique before you go into a, a major uh, important meeting. Stop and reflect. What's the big picture here? Right? What, do I, what do I want to accomplish? And what's the best way for me to do that? Do I need the team support? Who has something to lose when I go in here? What are the questions that you should be asking yourself in order to look at the entire system to be more successful? So you have to reflect on the system, not just on the players. So the most important system, oh yeah, let's see. Okay, although the principle may be easy to grasp, the practice is not rather than maintain perspective on the events that are surrounding and involving us, you can get swept up in them because you're, you're doing that work. Right? You want to convince them that what you're doing is important or what you're doing is right. It's not a systems view. got to get a little higher. Well, the most important system to start with, and you may not like this either, is the system of self. So we're going to talk about three, my, my call to action is uh, an invitation to become more intentional about your reflection on three main areas, okay? Know yourself, manage yourself, and nurture thyself. Yeah. Know thyself. Okay, we're going to begin with values. Why values? Values are exceedingly powerful forces within, within all of us, within everyone you deal with, whether they are aware of them or not. Unrecognized or unheeded, they can cause you and those around you a tremendous amount of havoc. So uh, there, there's lists of values on your table, and here they are here. So if you could uh, look at the list, if you're up or on the table, and can you prioritize them? Can you look at that list and pick your top three? Can you identify the ones that don't mean anything to you? Maybe the ones that are nice to have, but you don't carry with you on a daily basis. How hard is that? To make a list, to prioritize them. To prioritize authenticity or humility and honesty. Which one comes first? A funny thing about values, they're only identified in real time. Before I got married, I had this sweet little white leather car Kia. It was the coolest car. And then I got married, had kids, and got a minivan. Your values change depending upon your circumstances. I value our environment deeply. 
I was, I'm thrilled whenever they raised the miles per gallon on a car. I practically rejoiced when they came out with a Prius. Right? It matters to me. And then my daughter got her license. And I wanted her in a tank. Three miles per gallon, I couldn't care less. Right? Values are prioritized in real time. Right? It's not what you think. At any given, you know, any given day. How, you, how are you acting, right? In a split second, those values become very, very clear. If you pay attention to them, right? So you're not fooling yourself. And how do you uh, identify your values? Well, one way, which is painful, is to look at your calendar and look at your checkbook. Your calendar's reflecting where you put your time. Checkbook's reflecting where you put your money. Are those, when you, when you look at that, when you go home, or when you think about it, are they in line with your values? Are you living a life that expresses the values that you, that you hold here? Or someone else's? It is extremely useful to not only know your values, but to know what your managers value, right? And do they value uh, efficiency or thoroughness? Do they value uh, work-life balance or really going for it? Do they value safety or risk-taking, adventure? Uh, paying attention to those around you and looking at how they behave, what, how, what um, their behaviors tell you about their values, right? The best companies, you know, they pay attention to? The values of their customers, right? What do their customers value? Who are they, right? So like Apple, they know what their customers value. They, they value new and exciting and sleek, right? They value those things. It tells the world who they are when they carry their, when they carry their Mac around. Right? So, so paying attention to what people, what you value, what, what are your family's values? Does your family have some collective values? What does your boss value? What does your company value? What does your community value? How, how are, and how are they expressed? And is your community living up to its own values? So like I said, I'm going to be giving you lots of reflection, reflection questions. And, and, they, um, and I'm sure you'll come up with many, many more. Okay, more on the system of self. Triggers. We all have those. What sends you through the roof? What, what just makes you almost lose control? Right? Can you identify the last time you were triggered? The last time somebody just got on that last nerve? It's usually when one of your values has been threatened. When someone crosses one of your primary values and you get triggered. Go right up that ladder. One time I was bringing my son to his violin lesson and we're going up this small windy road through a school to where the symphony is meeting. And we're, going, we're late but we're going slowly because, you know, we're in a school. And this little car zips around me, speeds up the mountain, slams to a stop at the top. And I pulled up behind him and I said, somewhat politely but loudly, Hey, slow down, this is a school. And the guy goes back, I'm late. And I, not so politely, <laughs> said, it's not about you. Right? Hit that nerve. I clearly value some 
self-sacrifice for the greater good. Right? That's something that's, that's integral to who I am. And I saw him violate one of my core values. Like, not killing kids because, you know, he'll be a little later. So pay attention to what's, what sends you. And you can do this at home, right? Because your values with your parents or your children or your spouse are going to be a little different than they are at work or a little bit different than they are out in the community. So again, these are things to reflect on. When you have a reaction, take a little time that night and think about what is that reaction telling me about who I am? Okay. Oh, and it's also good to know what your um, boss's triggers are, too, who managers. Because you'll probably see them, hopefully, when it's not about you. But pay attention and think, okay, what value was just threatened there? And you'll, I mean, you'll learn a lot. Okay, next. Hungers. We all have those, too. There are things you seem to need in your life. So like triggers, they're different for everybody. There's the hunger to win, the hunger for uh, you know, your 15 minutes of fame, hunger for recognition, hunger for love, hunger for safety, for adventure. And while some of those hungers will get you into more trouble than others, and many are fine in moderation, you want to know about them. And you want to find a way to get those met intentionally. Because, say you've got a, a hunger for competition. If that sort of, if you don't get that need met, and it sneaks into, you know, a meeting you're having where you need to collaborate, it's not going to be helpful. Or if that, you know, competition that need for competition sneaks into a discussion you're having with your wife or your boyfriend. Not helpful. So you want to, and they will. I mean, those hungers will get met one way or another. So how do you identify the hungers? Again, reflect. Why did I just behave the way I behaved? What do I need? What need is not being met? Figure it out and, and, and find a way to meet it in a healthy way so it's not sneaking into your day to day. Uh, yeah, I need a I need a new uh, a new relationship with cookies myself. Okay. So are you folks aware do you do you know what a blind spot is? What the blind spot is? It's actually a biological uh, uh, phenomenon in your eye, on your retina, there's on the visual field. There's a, a small part of that visual field called the optic disc, where there are no photoreceptors. So you don't get any image detection there. And with both, both eyes open, you don't really notice because each of the, each a visual field for each eye covers the other's blind spot, so you, you just don't even notice it. However, even with one eye closed, you don't see it. You don't see your blind spot. And do you, do you know why? It's because your brain makes it up. It makes up what you're seeing, which is kind of freaky to me, that your brain can do that. Well, your brain literally makes up way more than just that little spot. That's why, that's why we use it colloquially, right? The blind spot. Your brain is an assumption-making machine. It's, and it does it really, really well. And it's very important. And it's very healthy. And it's very, uh, it's very positive, right? You take in about, what is it? Okay, 400 million bits of information a second. But 
that you're aware of, your, your body, your brain's aware of maybe 2,000 of them. So for all practical purposes, there's infinitely more information available to you than you even recognize, than you can even think about. So your, your mind eliminates, hides, deletes, or just plain doesn't pay attention to almost all of the information that's available to it. It only shows you what it thinks is necessary or useful. And it has made those determinations based on the way you were brought up, your culture, your, uh, what was expected of you, how you related to the world up and through this, through this um, time. So it's all personal. So we actually see differently depending upon who we are. And it gets even, it gets even scarier. It's your, lizard, it's your lizard brain that actually does part of that filtering. So it's not even your prefrontal cortex that's making the decisions about what you're going to get. So it's, we are, we are assumption-making machines. We are story-making machines, biologically. We're, like I said, we're pretty darn good at it. It's how we've survived. But your brain can make up some pretty crazy stuff. So, uh, unfortunately, without the information that it needs, your brain, unfortunately, will make up assumptions that are tied to your hungers, your triggers, your insecurities. All of this stems from, again, biology and evolution. So you, you're, in a, you're in an interaction and you think, she doesn't respect me. He just insulted me. And then we act on that story that our brain just made up. This tends to be most noticeable in relationships, where we can make up a story so fast without checking it out, right? Because you believe what your brain tells you. And we all do that. We're good at that. You probably wouldn't be here if your brain was really good at telling you the stuff you need. That's why you get your jobs, that's why you get promotions, because you're good at that. You can trust what your brain tells you. Most of the time. And reflecting on when you shouldn't or when you can't is, is vital. It's a vital skill. Again, those assumptions come from our world, our family, the broader community, social norms, television, uh, social media. That's where those stories come from and they're different for every, every person. So the great value of having a, a practice of reflection in your life is that by understanding why you do something, why you react in a certain way under particular circumstances, can help you uh, recognize your own feelings about stuff, your own values about things, and it gives you uh, a chance to recognize your strengths and your weaknesses uh, and where your assumptions are leading you astray. So you can build on those strengths, develop strategies to uh, minimize those weaknesses, uh, to have your unmet hungers met in a healthy way, better manage your triggers, and recognize when your brain is just making up assumptions, making up stories, so you can, you can ask questions clarifying questions to better understand what's really going on. So, don't believe everything you think. Okay, so that was Manage Thyself. Some hints to use reflection to, um, to understand thyself. Now we'll talk about managing yourself. So the three, three main parts to managing yourself. There's continuous learning, awareness and impact, self-regulation. So let's start with uh, some continuous learning. Hard skills, we all know what hard skills are, right? Do you know the right language? Do you, you know, know the technology? Soft skills, a little trickier. Um, if you go to, I don't, you know, I don't care how many different 
uh, courses or uh, websites, these are usually some of the top, top soft skills that people are looking for, communication skills. I, someone once told me that the, uh, the most, um, what was that, that quote? So, oh, the, most, the single most common problem with respect to communication is the belief that it actually took place. Because there's a world of difference between what you meant, what you said, what they heard, and then the story they made up about it. Right? Multi-step process. Lots of room for error. So it's a, and it's a lot more than just the transfer of facts, right? It's, uh, it's how, did, how did people feel, right? Were you motivating? Were you demotivating? So in that type of that thing, those things can be far more important to communicate than the facts. You can always get around to the facts and you know correct those later, but they'll remember how you made them feel. All right, that's a lot harder to move beyond. Critical thinking, you know, you, you folks are all good at critical thinkers. Are good at critical thinking. Understanding problems, thinking critically. Uh, the skills related to critical thinking, creativity, flexibility, curiosity, they're all supported by reflection. Right? Really thinking deeply about where you want to go. Where, you know, what's the nature of this problem? What systems is it in? Who's involved in that stuff? What do they think? What do they want? What are they afraid of? Leadership and or management, again, soft skill that everybody's looking for, both require reflection to do well. There are probably more hard skills to management, more things that you can read in a book, you know, try this A, B, C, D stuff. Not so much for leadership. Leadership is about influence as opposed to authority. That's a much softer skill, kind of hard to learn. Positivity. Do people like working with you? Can you go to your third meeting of the day and still search for the gem, the important little bit that's going to make the difference? Do you add life to a room or suck it into the abyss of frustration and disagreement? Employers are looking for positive people, people that add, right? people that want to that others want to work with. And so, so doing a little reflection on how you show up every day go a long way. Goes a long way. Teamwork, same type of thing. Can you be open to new perspectives? How did you react when someone uh, said something negative about your idea? Was your first reaction that's fascinating. That's curious. Why do you think that? Or did you get defensive? Right? So, curiosity. Reflection. Can you help everybody achieve? Can you identify and communicate what the shared purpose of your team is? What the shared purpose of your group is? Is that your North Star? I mean, are you, is that in the room with you during every conversation? That shared purpose, that goal? Something to think about. Your work ethic. Okay, do you have the best interests of the organization at heart? Are you reliable, dedicated, dependable, motivated? Can you persevere? Can you keep your eye on the ball? When can you do those things? And why and why not? Because not everybody can do them every time or in every situation. So knowing, you know, when you can be your best, you know, when you can when you can do those things without even thinking about it, is important. And when and when is going to be really hard to work on, and and you have to be really intentional about it. So reflect on the hard skills and the soft skills that are valued by your employer, by your manager, by your team. Which one helps you and your team thrive? Right? Which, one, which one do you have to bring to that meeting today? 
in order to move the ball down the road or down the field. Okay. Think of take 10 minutes before a meeting. What, what, what's our long range goal here? What does my team need? What do I need to bring? To bring you know, some motivation, some life, some creativity. What do we need? And go in with that in mind. Because you, you've thought about it first. Okay, personal growth is it's getting its own slide. When you stop paying attention to your growth as a human being, as a, as a deeper person, you do so at your own peril. Because uh, it will limit your success. So, and it, but it takes work. I mean, you, you got to listen to TED Talks, read books, including fiction, articles, say yes to new experiences, lean in, do it anyway, take courses that help you grow as a person and as a leader. The richer you are as a person, the more valuable you're going to be in most fields, and the happier you'll be in general. So, and I'll ask, don't, don't just do things to check box. Right? Got my master's, click. Yep, did this, click. Yep, listen to that, you know, that stupid blah, 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 blah training video they had me listen to, check. But, but bring, bring your energy, right? Bring your balcony mind, your balcony view. Where are the gems in that, in that third meeting of the day? And you're like, okay, oh my God, really? Really, I'd like to get some work done? There's a gem there. Find it. I always think that if you're bored, you're not trying hard enough. Right? You gotta try a little harder to, to learn, to see, to, uh, to make a difference, right? To see what's really going on. You can always just go on the balcony and say, okay, what systems are in, are, are in play here? Practice, right? Bring some, bring some value. Okay, awareness and impact. Manage thyself. So this is, um, so you're, you're going to know yourself, you're going to manage thyself. Do you, know how, do you know how others view you? Do people, do, do people smile when you enter the room? Do they stop and listen when you, when you say something because they, they respect what you've got to say? What would, what would your team members say is your superpower? What is it that you bring of value to that team? Right? Do you, do you know what they think of you? Do they, do they know what they think your strength is? What they value when you walk into the room? It's, a, you know, it's, great, it's a great thing to know. It's a great thing to ask. And you, and you can either ask or you can observe and, and see what it is that people count on you for. So this type of reflection is really critical when you're dealing with cultural, religious, racial, uh, gender-specific differences and inequities. Right? You want to pay attention to how you're showing up and your, the awareness of your impact on others. So again, a crucial, crucial skill. I'm becoming more so day by day. So I, I'm sure you know, well, I'm sure some of you know why there's, it's a, path, uh, there's a present on the slide. Because you've heard it, I'm sure, a million times. Yeah, yes, and get some nods and smiles. Feedback, right? Feedback is a gift. You know, we've all heard that. Oh my God, feedback! I hate feedback. You know, you think back and you're like, oh man. Yeah, automatically, I'm sure that like some people there, their their hair is standing up on the back. Not feedback, not feedback. They'd be traumatized. So, while valuable, it can be triggering because of you know, past experiences. So if you can reframe in your mind what feedback is, it can be helpful. So you can think of feedback as more like, a friend of mine uses the term, feed forward. So what can I take? You know, if you've identified a skill that you need or uh, something that you want to develop, you can, you can go out and get that feed forward before it's even given to you. So you've got a problem, you know, you talk to your colleagues, you talk to your manager, hey, you know, I'm having this issue, what, you know, what, what skills should I be working on when I'm working through this? And they'll, and they'll tell you, 
and you can and you can say, hey, thanks, because you I mean you you asked for it, you 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 solicited it from them, and it, and it, it makes you feel better, it makes them feel better. It's just another way to reframe something that is exceedingly valuable and tough to do. Oh, and you can assume that there's a return receipt in the box, right? If you open it and try it on and it doesn't fit, take it back. You don't have to keep it, right? Now, if you get the same gift three years in a row, you might want to think about that, maybe a little, a little more, but in general, try it on if it fits, great. If it doesn't, you'll get another one. Awareness and impact, yeah. So self-regulation. Someone who has good self-regulation has the ability to keep their emotions in check, and you can resist impulsive behaviors that might worsen a situation. You've got choices. You've got a range of ways that you can react to something. And you can pick the reaction that's going to help you get where you want to go. Right? Not just the first thing that comes up. I like saying, uh, or I love the saying, that freedom is... The power to choose. Freedom is the space between stimulus and response. Right? Most of us, have, there's a stimulus, and without any self-reflection, there's an immediate reaction. You're reacting to what's coming at you. And that's most of us most of the time. Right? Or, with a, a reflection practice, you can make that space bigger. So there's the same stimulus, but you've got some freedom to choose. What's the best way to react to get where I want to go? What's the best way to react to save the relationship? Right? Because relationships are important. Leadership is all about relationships. It's all about relationships. So you get to choose. I don't know if you can, can you, can you have that play? That's actually a, a short video. Ah, it's fine. If you, um, this is a, it's a really short video. It's like three minutes. And it's fabulous. It's fun and it's easy. And um, that's okay. Mindfulness is a superpower. And it's, and it's about increasing that space between stimulus and response. Okay, so there was know thyself, manage thyself, and now we're at nurture thyself. Nurture your body. Right? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you eating good food? Are you sleeping enough at night? Your mind, are you aware of your needs? Are you aware of your feelings? Do you know what you like? Do you know what you need to feel fulfilled? Do you have a practice of gratitude? Which releases serotonin, by the way. So, and that's all about finding the gems. Relationships. As humans, we are made to live in community. Okay, we, we've evolved that way. Are you tending to yours? Are you tending to your relationships? Do you have people in your life who feed the best parts of yourself? Who reflect to you the person you want to be? Do you have people like that on your team? Do you have people like that at work? Do you have people like that at home? Do you punch the clock and head out and go out for the night? If you, if you give, the more you give in the relationships that you have that matter to you, uh, 
oxytocin is released for both of you. And that's a motivator. So you know, that's why they say give. Right? If you're feeling down, go serve somebody else. Because it, it, it makes everybody feel better. Okay, nurturing thyself. That means controlling your stress. Right? Now we all have stress. Stress, uh, whether it's real or imagined, physical or psychological, the body releases waves of stress hormones. Adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol. There are veritable stress tsunami going on inside you when you feel threatened. And, it, and then there's rapid changes throughout your whole body. So, and for all practical purposes, they are good, good changes, right? Perfectly designed to help us meet the challenges of stress per our evolutionary cycle. So long as we follow through to the next step, flight, freeze, fawn, uh, to complete that situation in some way. And it has to be short term. So a little bit more about our evolution. So you can, you can think of, uh, you know, wild animals, right? So you can either be the hunted or the hunting. And there are big differences. So there's still danger, right? You're still, you know, going and you're, you're seeing this wild animal, this danger. And yet your body reacts completely differently to the two scenarios, right? Still facing that, that um, saber-toothed tiger. When you're hunted, you're unprepared. It's unintentional. You're surprised. There's no encouragement from your community. And, and as a matter of fact, you could be judged, you know, for the negative things. There's fear, there's anxiety. But when you're hunted, you're prepared. It's intentional. It's expected. You have community support. Right? Because they, they want you to go out and hunt. There's excitement, anticipation. And in, in both situations, there's still the danger. But your body reacts completely differently. If you stay on the left side there, the hunted side, um, that can kill you after years of that. If you go through your days like that, you know, always afraid about the next deadline, always afraid about the next meeting, or always afraid for the next uh, uh, performance review, it's not good. It's not good for you. So this, this is all into nurturing yourself. Right? So one of the things that you can do is move from reacting to intention. Right? That's, that's all the different, difference was, right, with the wild animal. One was a reaction, and one is an intention. And they release slightly different stress hormones. When you're reacting, it's cortisol, it's adrenaline, that stuff you only want in small doses. When you're intentional, you get more dopamine, you get more endorphins. This stuff is fun. That stuff, it does all the same stuff. It raises your awareness, it heightens your acuity. But it does so in a much healthier way. So Simon Sinek, you guys know about Simon Sinek? Another guy you should be listening to yeah, when you're doing your continuous learning? Look up Simon Sinek, he's got great stuff. But he talks about a silly question that um, uh, uh, newscasters ask Olympic athletes. Like, were you nervous? And he says, they all say the same thing. No. I was excited. They're going at the intention side, not the reaction side. So they're using those chemicals that are being released positively. Right? And it's helping them achieve not hurting them. Okay, so what can we do to stay on that good side? Reflection. Uh, surprise, surprise, I was going to say that. Uh, dopamine is produced when you complete a task and feel good about it. Hence the checklist, right? How many use a checklist? How many people use a checklist? It actually releases dopamine. Yes, did that. So celebrate the little victories. 
You celebrate the little victories on your teams, right? We got to hear. You know, say something about it, because it releases endorphins. Um, when you're leading, yeah, praise those around you, because a dopamine supports motivation. So you want it, you want people motivated? Give them, give them a little pat on the back. It's biology. And for more endorphins, yeah, exercise and laughter. So that's why uh, you seem to have a lot more energy and a lot more, um, uh, a lot more gets done at the meetings where you know somebody comes in and cracks a couple of good jokes and the joke lingers on for the whole meeting. Because laughter releases endorphins. Okay, we lead through relationships. And you have to begin by understanding yourself. Are you acting in alignment with your values? Do you know your triggers and hungers? Reflect on how effective you are at managing yourself and your interactions with others. Do you know what it takes to nurture yourself so that you can show up for yourself, for your team, for your organization, for your family? Harness the power of the practice of reflection. My boss is an amazing leader. He's brilliant. He leads in his church, in his community. He spends most of every single Monday in reflection. He sits in his big brown chair. He's got his books and his pencils. He's got some books of wisdom and religion nearby, his sacred books and he reflects. That is his superpower. Leaders from all over ask for his counsel because he has taken the time to reflect deeply on his life, his family, his organization, and his communities. His counsel is wise because he has taken the time to reflect on changes in himself, in his family, on his team, in his community. His counsel is valuable because he reflects on possible scenarios and the skills needed to deal with each one, his counsel is effective. All great leaders take time to reflect. What's changed in the environment? What systems are giving us the current outcome? What relationships are maintaining the status quo? How, what can I do to affect the system? Who do I need to be? What do I, do I need, who do I need to lead? Because you can lead. You can leave from anywhere you are. So my advice is to take time to reflect, to develop a reflective practice. And weekly, daily, 10 minutes. Um, what does success mean to you at this moment? Nurturing your practice of reflection and it can change your world. Does anybody have any, any questions? Yes, yes. So, uh, you were talking about the intention part, right? Yes. So, how much aggression should be involved in the intention? In the intention? Yeah, like, uh, like with the intention, do you need to have aggression also? Or is, like, with the positivity, the aggression will come? How much aggression do you need? Um, is context specific. That's the thing about intention. It really depends on what's happening around you, you know, and, and what and what which, what's your main goal, right? So how much do you need? It, it, that's where the reflection comes in. It will tell you. The, the better you get at it, the more you're going to recognize what is needed in that particular instance. Is it you know? Is it seriousness? Is it silliness? Do I need a stronger relationship here? Do I need to test this relationship? So, so I mean, that's the beauty of reflection. And that the better you get, the more accurate you can be about what you need. Yes? How do we make sure that uh, we are unbiased while we are reflecting? How do we make sure what? That you are unbiased towards certain things, right? Oh, that you're unbiased? Why reflecting? Uh, again, 
that's a tough one. And it comes, it comes with practice, because in the beginning, like I said, we all believe our own stories, all, all, like almost always, right? So the more you do it, the more you can stop and say, was that an assumption? Right? Every time you say, every time your brain tells you a fact, is it that really a fact? Could be, could be right. I, I know a leader who before uh, he goes into any meeting, he stands outside and, he, and he, he, he centers himself and he says, I'm going to assume that I'm wrong. So I'm wrong. So he walks in so he can hear other perspectives. And he has to do that because otherwise his brain just keeps telling him he's right and he doesn't listen deeply enough. So with biases, it, that's, a, that's a tough one. And talking to others, gathering more perspectives, get, uh, you know, learning, that's where the personal growth comes in, because you're going to learn about different ways of seeing the world, about, about different um, ways people react, and you can start to recognize where what you're telling yourself is, is just a story that's been going on in your head you know, for most of your adult life. Does that help? Okay. Anyone else with a question about the importance of reflection? How many people reflect? Wow. That's awesome. I, I was on this job five years. My boss kept saying, are you reflecting yet? And I'm like, yeah. that was like, do I have to? You know, blank piece of paper in front of me. Oh, man, it was brutal. It's a tough thing for some people to start. And a lot of us say we don't have time. Right? Like, like exercising, like eating right. We don't have time. Well, you, it, you, you, will, you will hit your ceiling faster if you don't reflect. Anything else? Thank you, Kerry. That was very insightful. We'll take a break. Um, let's gather back at 6.20. Uh, we'll start with uh, our second keynote presentation. Uh, we have a few hot beverages, a few snacks. Uh, please help yourselves, uh, socialize, start working with your checklist. Thank you. Thank you, Pravi. Welcome back. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to first of all SMM. I would like to give kudos to SMM for hosting this first event. It's a great event. So, big round of applause. Okay, my name is Mahesh Kenny. Um, I've been in the Seattle area for almost 32 years. Um, spent 23 years at Microsoft in various engineering roles and uh, now we're with uh, the president of Harbinger Systems, which is based out of Pune as well as in Redmond. Um, and I've been with Harbinger Systems for the last three years. But today is all about uh, two great topics, and it's all about networking, all about uh, finding those entrepreneurs and connecting them with other like-minded folks. Um, so it's a great event overall. Thank you. So I know uh, Amol Kerkar is is talking on, um, he's going to be presenting a fascinating, uh, on a fascinating topic. I know Amol for almost now 18 years, first as a friend, then as a, and as a community member of uh, Seattle Maharashtra Mandal, then as a musician, uh, some of you already know that he's a great singer as well as a musician, music composer, that's, uh, that's probably his second profession or second passion. Then also as a technologist, um, some of you know that Amos spent almost seven plus years at Microsoft in various development roles. Then um, he worked as an entrepreneur. Um, he had this great product called Aflatoon, which I was a member of or uh, I was a user of. 
um, and that that um, that they are founded, that is started. He's also played various role, other roles, like as a CTO of various companies, local companies in Seattle area. Uh, last four years with Office Space. But his passion and journey began at UT Austin, where he did his research in um, computational neurobiology, um, neural networks. This was. Um, back in, this again from LinkedIn, so I'm not revealing his age by any means. Um, this is back in late, I mean, 98 to 2000 time frame. Um, and now he's back to doing research on, on AI again. But it's not a traditional AI, this is not, uh, even though AI is futuristic looking, um, everybody's talking about AI nowadays. So he's going to talk about future of AI. Uh, so it's a fascinating topic. I would reveal much more than this, and I will hand it over to Amol. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction and actually being one of the major parts of me being here today. Uh, he's the one who introduced uh, the topic to the committee for this event and they graciously accepted. So I thank the committee wholeheartedly. We heard a wonderful talk by Karen and as she was talking, one point after the other, I kept thinking the two talks are almost as if we, we knew what we're going to talk about and the main themes are the same, except that we are looking at them from a completely different perspective. So the main themes in her talk were self and how the brain is a storytelling engine. And same themes would continue in this presentation. We all know AI, right? In university campuses and offices of big companies, it's often considered the next best thing since sliced bread. And I'm tempted to compare AI with bread. There are a lot of similarities. AI comes in different varieties, just like bread. There is vocaccia, there is baguettes, uh, there's cinnamon rolls, and so on. Bread gets baked in many artisan bakeries. Those bakeries make exotic types of breads and in small batches and um, uh, at the same time we have industrial kitchens making bread by the truckloads. They're all about efficiency and they can make bread for everybody. There's a whole ecosystem around bread. There are people who make bread, of course, there are people who help others make better bread. And there are recipe books, culinary schools, and even reality shows about bread and AI. But of course, bread has issues. It can go bad. And it takes a lot of heat to bake. And bread must be baked with precision. If you don't keep it in the oven too long uh, or long enough, it would be underdone and you can't eat it. If you keep it there too long, it'll just burn and again, it's useless. Bread needs to be baked at the perfect, precise temperatures, keeping the precise humidity in the oven and so on. And alas, bread contains gluten. Everybody likes to hate gluten, right? 
about 1% of the population actually has issues with gluten. That they, they can't really eat it. Uh, most other people just avoid it because it's a little bit difficult to digest. And bread has to be used in the right context. You can't really pair sliced bread with uh, Indian curry. I actually, every once in a while I go to an Indian restaurant, I like to order sliced bread with my curry just to see the expression on the waiter's face. So we know, we know bread, we know, right? Uh, we use it every day. But now imagine, there's this miracle bread. This miracle bread is not finicky about precise baking techniques or procedures. It practically breaks itself once you just throw some ingredients together. And this miracle bread is highly versatile. You can make a nice sandwich with it, or when you try to toss it on salad, it would turn into nice crispy croutons. You can make a nice burger with it, and it will miraculously change into fluffy naan if you want to go eat it with Indian food. Everybody has tasted this miracle bread. But nobody knows the recipe for it. Only if we could figure out what the recipe is, we can do amazing things. End world hunger, conquer the stars, who knows what. This miracle bread is artificial general intelligence, which is human level or human like artificial intelligence. Today's AI systems have to be tailor-made for each application separately. But AGI, just like us, would be able to tackle many different problems without actually having to tweak the system itself. So how do we do it? And how would AGI really go about solving any kinds of problems that you can throw at it? At the core, we and this supposed AGI would have to write small programs and then combine those programs together to make bigger programs and combine those together to make even bigger programs and algorithms and whatnot. And our brain is doing that all the time and that's how we end up solving many different problems. So it is hypothesized, uh, hypothesized that once we make an AGI system like this that is able to write these programs and combine those programs together to solve problems, eventually what's going to happen is it's going to end up writing an AGI system that's slightly better than itself. And once that happens, that is what is referred to as technological singularity. It is a point or a process where AGI would improve itself so rapidly and to capabilities completely beyond our comprehension so that there is no prediction of what comes next possible. So the question is, yes, you know, we, we, we want this AGI, right? Uh, we don't want to have to write different AI systems for different, uh, different problems. Why don't we have it yet? What's holding us back? What are we missing? So before we look at what we are missing from building an AGI, let's look at what AI can do for us today. Can you identify any of these people? Any guesses? Sorry, that's a 
trick question. These are not real people. These are faces generated by deep neural network. AI can not only create realistic visuals, it is now able to create visuals, the realistic sound and conversations. So last year, Google Duplex, uh, earlier this year actually, Google Duplex was announced, which is a system that can make phone calls on your behalf and have a conversation uh, to say make a reservation for you. So here's a quick demo of how that sounds like. Go player. 
including beating the previous AI that Google had, had designed. So this level of exponential improvement starts to become hard to fathom where this might go. But AI is still not intelligent yet. We don't really call an AI system, hey, look at that smart machine, or, or hey, that was, that was uh, uh, a lot of common sense that the machine used. No, AI still lacks some core um, facets of intelligence that we as humans show. AI can be fooled really easily. A um, couple of years ago there was this paper uh, where they created these fake images that the best image recognition systems at that time recognized with high confidence as penguin and starfish and baseball and so on. Obviously, we were able to fool that system really easily. And a cynic like me would say, all the AI systems that are being built are so fine-tuned by the AI engineers. They're setting what kind of architecture it's going to have, how long it's going to train, what kind of data it's going to train on, and they're, they're, they're doing this tuning across many sets of parameters and picking the right set of parameters to then say, hey, look at this AI, it's solving this problem. But who is really solving the problem? There's a, uh, there's a possibility that all that setup has given an unfair advantage to the AI for solving that one problem. And of course, as we all know, there's something more to human intelligence than what AIs can do right now. I'm going to play this short video. This was an experiment uh, done by a psychology team, um, I think in 2006, where you'll see the experimenter who is this person in the red shirt, and the participant in this experiment is this 18-month-old toddler who is standing there in the corner. Let's just watch what happens here. seems so fluid, so automatic, so effortless. But when we actually start thinking about what all must have gone inside his mind, it's a completely different story. So if we, if we think about what all went through his mind, here's, here's some, some of the few things. I'm, I'm not going to be able to list out everything, but just a top level things. Okay, he's observing the world around him. He's able to recognize things, objects and people and books and closets and, and the, the, the fact that this person is holding the books. Then he's able to look at a sequence of these images as they're coming into his mind and somehow stitch together this story that this person is carrying books with him and he's moving towards the closet. Then something almost miraculous happens. He's able to read the mind of the person. He has a model of the person's personality, his desires, his goals. And he's actually able to predict that Hey, it looks like this person wants to put these books in the closet. 
Now, with that in mind, he can also he also has a really fine-tuned physics engine running in his mind, telling him that books cannot pass through doors. That sounds like a very simple fact for us, but for computers, or just to, to really figure out what's going on, that is a hard thing to do. Books cannot go through doors. Doors need to be opened. He then knows that the person is not able to open the door because his hands are occupied. That's another level of being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and experiencing the world through their eyes. Once he, once he makes that determination, he then has to figure out that I exist as a person in this room and I have this phenomenal capability of, make, of, of making things happen, right? And then he is able to place himself in that whole flow of activity that this person is doing, figuring out that, okay, he can open the door. Then he generates a highly complex set of muscle motor neuron firing sequences that makes him go over there pull the door open and at that point he makes sure that there is space in the closet and the closet looks like something that books can be put into and then he shows a phenomenal capability of awareness of the surrounding he knows that the person needs to go complete his task and put the books in the closet but the path would take him through where I am right now. So he steps back to make room for that person and then he just makes one eye contact and says, here you go. What a phenomenal set of things that are happening in that little child's mind. And this is still 18 month old baby, right? We, we don't consider them particularly, you know, intelligent. So, this is the challenge in front of today's AI. Yes, we can do simple things, but how can we get here? What is this missing piece? Turns out, turns out a lot of the missing pieces that we could list are to do with our consciousness. Awareness, common sense, reading other people's minds, a sense of self, and a drive to act. All of those are different facets of what we consider our unique consciousness. So how can you, how can you think of bringing these kind of things in AI systems? It's a, it's a long set of things that we, one could try to bring in, but let's just focus on two, two particularly important things. Right? One is perception of like basically observing the world and making inferences about what's out there. And selfhood. Okay, I'm going to play a garbled audio and just listen to it intently and see what words pop into your mind. Anybody recognize what's being said? It's really hard, right? It's just completely, complete garbled sound. Now I'm going to play the, 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 the clip before it was garbled. John Harris, Jordan Peterson and Sadhguru walk into a bar. Now let's listen to the garbled audio again. Again, don't, don't, don't make an effort to, to hear things in it. Just 
wait and watch what words come to you. Our, our common understanding or, or the way AI systems are built is essentially this. You know, you bring in some input, in this case audio signal, run it through some neural network and out come words. But this cannot be true. Because when you heard the same garbled sound the first time, no words came out. And they came out perfectly well the second time you heard it. Turns out, in the last 15 to 20 years, neuroscience has made significant advances in understanding this facet of our brain. Here is how we do it. We start with words. We'll, we'll, we won't go too much into where these words come from, but I think, I think you'll get a feel for that as we talk about it. So we start with words. We use our neural network to generate audio signal. This is the audio signal that we created in our mind. And then we just compare with what's actually coming into our ears. They happen to match. Oh, uh, I must have heard those words. It's a completely different way of doing perception. And if you're not convinced, just look at how these things get trained. The typical neural networks get trained by comparing the words uh, on the left hand side, the words at the top that they produce versus the words that should have been produced. That becomes an error in the network and we train the network so that the network produces the right words. On the right hand side though, the same prediction error gets used to change what words we should have had in our mind to begin with. Now let's talk about the second aspect of consciousness that we're looking at, which is selfhood. All of you right now are experiencing this highly immersive 3D movie that you, as an individual, is playing the central character. And this sense of self is so strong that, you know, yes, I know, of course, of course I'm me, right? We, we almost take it for granted, but we shouldn't. Because psychologists would tell you that all different kinds of, all, all different attributes of your selfhood can be challenged and really easily too. So what are those attributes? You know, self um, is the experience of having a body, being the body, having this first person point of view on the world, on the world, and experience, uh, and experiencing the ability to act in the world and the experience of knowing that you are the one who made something happen. All these are different aspects of your selfhood. And all of them can be really easily challenged. So I'm going to show you an experiment. You can do this at home. It's a lot of fun. You'll see this experimenter in the green, uh, green chair. He's going to touch two um, brushes, one on the real hand of the person and one on the rubber glove uh, or, or a rubber hand that is placed. And the subject in this experiment can't really see his own hand. He can only see the rubber hand. What happens when the experimenter keeps touching both those hands, the same fingers, the same motion, that after, say, 30 seconds or 40 seconds, 
this person actually starts to believe what happened? <laughs> actually starts to believe that the rubber hand is actually part of his own body. That's an uncanny sensation and you can all observe that if you do this experiment. Let's look. So the illusion is getting sad. <laughs> right? So he, he, he believed that the rubber hand was his, his hand. What is happening here? Our sense of what is part of our body versus what is not is getting challenged and challenged so easily. Now if you look at this through the lens of the same type of predictive mechanism that we looked at for, for, for our uh, perception, this is what we get. We start with our model of what our body is right now. That model will predict that, hey, this is a rubber hand, not part of my body which will make prediction that I should not feel any touch when somebody touches that rubber hand. But hey, there's, there's this big error happening here. I can actually feel touch when the rubber hand is getting touched. What's going on here? Of course, the experimenter is also touching his real hand. That's, that's what's actually happening. But he has no way of knowing because he can't see that. So now, brain sitting inside this skull and only looking at the signals that are coming in has only one way to reduce this prediction error. And what is that one way? Hmm, I have to change my model of what my body is. Maybe this rubber hand is part of my body. If that were the case, then I should feel touch when somebody touches the rubber hand. Oh, yes, I'm feeling touch. No prediction error. Everything is right with the world. Now that is what's happening in our minds and brains. So, if we look at many different aspects of consciousness, many of those can be explained with this type of prediction error minimization framework. So at i3ai.org, which is, which is my lab, I'm trying to build models that use this type of predictive coding. And don't, don't, don't worry about the details. Uh, what I do want to uh, tell you about is that bring, trying to bring in aspects of consciousness into AI models will possibly bring us all those good human-like intelligent attributes to that AI. But at the same time, it might help us understand our own psychology better. For example, this proposed network architecture has these properties where the, 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 the units on the right hand side, if they somehow malfunction or are deficient, this network should hallucinate. If the ones on the left hand side are deficient, this network should feel as if it is watching a movie rather than experiencing what's coming in. And all those the zero and the ones at the top, I believe could represent the signal of consciousness that is generated by our brainstem. It is, I won't get going to too much detail, otherwise we'll be all uh, here all night. But the, the, the idea is that maybe we can find answers to the deepest questions about our own psychology by exploring models like these. 
What about machine consciousness? Would, would machines ever become like fully conscious and, and, and uh, fully like people, right? Um, we don't know yet. There's one aspect of, aspect of consciousness that we don't have a really good handle on, which is the phenomenal consciousness, which is our ability to feel, right? Um, we don't have a good predictive coding model for that yet. But there are, there, are, there are possibilities where that might actually emerge from the from rest of the architecture. So we're not sure about machine consciousness. But when we look at AI of the future, if we follow a path towards AGI and potentially machine consciousness that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do in my work, AI of the future will be a bit more human. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, please. What about pain? Pain. Yeah, yeah that is that is the 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 feeling part of it. We know a lot about pain and we actually know a lot about the neuroscience of emotions in general and we could produce pain just by adding some chemicals in the brain. Uh, we, we know why pain exists but the question of whether we can actually make machines feel pain it's still out there. What is the way to teach a common sense to the machine? So you have a predictive model, you have the patterns, and you have to use information and making that new one right? and then it deriving into a certain kind of objective. So how do you teach a common sense to the machine, which you narrated exactly in your video? Common sense is, is really complex. What common sense actually is, is the ability that we have to process many possibilities forward and picking the one that actually makes most sense. And because we have this predictive model in the brain which the whole job of that is to keep hallucinating things. So internally what most likely is happening when we are we're talking about common sense is that we're actually producing many different movies or many different scenarios and making and picking the one that has the best outcome that we're looking for. So it feels like, oh, I just did it with common sense, but by doing that with common sense, you have actually rejected a lot of the other possibilities. So, yeah, not, not, not a clean answer, because it is a, it is a very different or, or a difficult concept to, to even define. Because you, uh, 
like touch, right? Touch is something like uh, if if that man if he didn't have his eyesight or he he wouldn't have never reacted to that thing that he did on the rubber hand, right? So the question of him just getting out his hand would have never come up. It's just because he has this visibility, he could sense that thing. Otherwise, it couldn't have been that way. So I'm just a bit confused. Like uh, from the whole AI perspective, are we thinking of all the other aspects? Like, Tapping the other human senses into the machine? I would, I would say so. I mean, we, we, in AI, generally we use vision as the, as the primary thing that we test and build models on. It's because vision is our sort of primary sense that we use to make sense of the world. And also, it is the visual pathways of the brain that are most studied and known in detail as to what goes on in, in, the, uh, in, in the sequence of processing. So that's why you see uh, like images and videos being sort of the primary focus for AI today. But the same principle should apply to all other senses. And once, once we have a handle of one uh, sense, uh, Building a multimodal system where the senses can can have their own pipelines, and at some point they start merging and talking with each other. Um, that's that is something to look forward to. So another question was like, do we need to care about our jobs? <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, the, the the big elephant in the room is that. If and when AGI happens, we're essentially, you know, not jobless, but you know, not not really needed for most jobs, right? Um, and that's the, the 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 quicker we just accept that, I think the easier it will be for us. And the and I'm not I'm not trying to be callous about it. It is just the way things work, right? I mean, we, we all know what industrial revolution did to all the horse buyers, people, right? It's just a fact of life. When people adapt and, and change, and societies change, and uh, humanity moves forward. So, any jobs that will be created will be created in the AI world, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but then again, we're talking about the Algorithms being so powerful that they learn themselves how to code in a better way and make algorithms much better. So I <laughs> yeah, probably coding will be the last job for humans <laughs> because that is that is li literally the, the definition of AGI is something that can code itself, right? So, so yeah. Until then, that happens. I guess the the, the programmers' jobs are relatively safe. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm supposed to ask a question sitting on this side. Okay. You're, you're, you're required to. <laughs> but I have to say this. You know, i got to put this contrarian skeptic hat, okay? I'll tell you why. I talked about 35 years ago. I was living in Washington. My major was structural dynamics. And mine was computer sciences. Okay? And at that time, I took first one class in artificial intelligence, okay? I forgot the name of the professor at the time, but you know, we had you know, machine learning, pattern recognition, neural networks, pearl solving. Uh, last year, Curtis C. Boyne, I took another AI class from MIT, and it had pattern recognition and neural network. So, you know, in 35 years, uh, the academic part has not changed much, okay? Only thing we didn't have 35 years ago is the amount of memory we used to have in computers. And processing power. You know, and I think, by, and this is, I'm no expert on this obviously, because otherwise I'll be speaking, it's the human speaking here. Uh, I think intelligence is definitely related to the amount of memory and neural networks we have. And as we say, brain cells are way too many, then maybe neural networks, okay. So by, by you know, I, I don't take too, too many shots, and we can talk about it later on, but in those days, I thought AI yeah, was hyped up. Yeah, I get a feeling AI yeah, will be hyped up now because if we try to do AI same as people, 
then we don't need it because we have the meaning. The reason I got interested in this is when you go to say Boeing, we go to Mars, okay? It takes 18 months to go there, okay? You send a message from moon, it was like 20 minutes message coming in. Now it's going to be hours and days, okay? So we need something, we thought we needed something, robots and stuff, who will do that work, okay? And you know, then my question was, okay, I guess if we need robots and artificial for that, we cut all these guys. I mean, if we're going to create robots or AI just like us, we don't need it, okay? But anyway, so this is well, I mean, this interesting topic, okay? My feeling is, you know, AI will not be where we think it will be in my lifetime, okay? Of course, that's not many years, but maybe yours, okay? So keep that in mind. Thank you. I mean, you, you, you raise a lot of good points, and AI, as we know, is hyped. It's just a fact uh, of, of, of the matter. But what's happening though in the last eight to 10 years is that AI has started becoming practical, which, is, which changes it from something that academics cook up in their research labs to something that Google can and Microsoft can put in our phones. And everybody has it, right? So, so there, there's, a, there's, there's the democratization uh, of, of AI. But again, that is not real AI as in, it's not AGI. And the question whether we need or whether we should build AGI, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a philosophical question for humanity to, to, to answer. On the practical side, if it is possible to do it, somebody will do it. And the rest of us would keep philosophizing about it. So, so might as well be the ones who actually do it. And this, this, this is hope. Uh, there's another, <laughs> the reason that I want to build AGI is that I find AI systems highly dangerous. The reason is that they're tools, right? And, and you can take a tool and put it to any use that you, you want to put it to. And the tool is not going to say, oh, I don't think that's a good thing to do. It's just going to obey. Now, in a possible future where the rogue people, the bad people have these powerful AI tools, we need somebody on our side that can actually watch for us. And given AI is going to probably be so far beyond human comprehension, we need our own set of super intelligent AIs on our side. And that's where AGI comes in, in my mind. It's that, it's that instinct of seeing somebody not being able to uh, do their job and the drive to go and help. That is something that we need in, in, in the AIs that that are on the good side. Uh, we'll be able to take a couple of more questions, maybe one more after this. Depends yes. on the answer too, I guess. Thank you. So it's not a, about a question, but uh, just a thought. Like, can we think of AI getting extended to uh, augment the uh, human power than to replace it. Instead, like our soldiers are uh, on duty on CHN, in CHN, can we think of AI to augment that or to as an auxiliary force to keep an eye on the terrorists or even uh, augment the power or empower our farmers working in, in different weather conditions. Uh, I'm, I'm generally talking about the ground level of the India. But that's how I can think. I'm, I'm, I'm not scratch the color, color over it on, but that's how can we think of AI? Yeah, very good point. I mean, uh, ultimately, humans being selfish, we want to build things that will end up helping us. Right, uh, and and 
I mean, if we have AGI systems, or even fairly advanced AI systems, they can be deployed in all those situations and, and to, to keep humans out of harm's way. I mean, that's, that's kind of sort of the natural application of AI. Yeah, I mean, in, uh, Day to day activities like booking an appointment for haircut is like something which is making us more lazy. But this is something you know uh, we can think of uh, really uh, uh, you know empowering the uh, beyond human power. I think I think the applications that we see coming out are sort of glimpses in the abilities of what things can be, right? The same same duplex system could actually be used in uh, on the front lines to communicate between the soldiers and the headquarters or giving the headquarters automated status updates so it can it can all fit somewhere and these are all just capabilities being demonstrated Like no more questions. Thank you so much. That was very informative. I am sure lots of have uh, intrigued with the information now because uh, Amul was able to present it in very uh, layman term to be able to understand uh, for everyone. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, the next session is uh, it's more of a open session where you get to talk to everyone. You already did that a little bit. So I want you to start looking into the checklist. Start doing these things. Uh, this event will be as effective as you do it. So reach out to people, talk to people. Uh, we have uh, mentors here, so people who want to volunteer for mentoring. Uh, we have lots of people who want to seek mentor, uh, being a mentee. Uh, so we'll have people who want to be a mentor just stand up so that others can uh, and we'll start from there. So people who want to seek mentorship can come talk to you. So I see one over there. Um, otherwise, there are lots of senior people here, so I really want you, know, you people to really volunteer. Uh, at least have the conversation today. Uh, same goes with the job recruiters, employers. Uh, if we have any, they can stand up so that people who are looking for alternate opportunities uh, can also reach out. We have got one over there, we have uh, here. So uh, do make sure to reach out to them. Uh, the third category is the business experts, entrepreneurs, established businessmen uh, here in the Puget Sound area. So if you could please stand up, people who want to uh, start a startup or need more information or just have a basic chat so they can also have a chat with that to you. Uh, so, uh, who are so one hand is there so make sure to talk to them and these are the instructions um, most of you already got the bags so make sure to get them while you're leaving um, we have one hour now so uh, we have some food as well some other food light dinner so uh, feel free to grab some food and uh, start socializing thank you uh, before, before I stop, I uh, just want to uh, say thank you to our grant sponsors, Take Mahindra and Hybro Systems, our event sponsors, LNT and Harbinger Systems. Uh, so, uh, both. Shantanu and they would like to address you uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, 
Uh, I'm Shantanu Mohe and I'm part of the sales leadership team at Tech Mahindra here in Redmond. Uh, first and foremost, I would really like to congratulate uh, Seattle Maharashtra Mandar for organizing this first of its kind event. Uh, I was, um, just a few days back, I was inviting uh, a couple of folks at Microsoft and he commented that in general, our community or uh, uh, Maharashtrians for that matter, kind of suck at this. <laughs> so, uh, I was taken a little aback, but uh, we have proven him wrong, so I would like ourselves to congratulate and applaud for ourselves uh, that on this bright Saturday afternoon, we took time and effort to come here and meet with our fellow uh, professionals and business uh, experts in the community. So, thank you, uh, Seattle Maharashtra Mandal. Uh, talking a little bit about uh, Tech Mahindra, uh, you all might be knowing that we are part of the Mahindra conglomerate. It's a 20 billion dollar con conglomerate across the globe and Tech Mahindra is the IT arm of the Mahindra conglomerate. Uh, we uh, live by the ethos of the Mahindra group. So whether it's uh, accepting no limits, uh, going far and beyond, uh, driving a positive change, these are the ethos that we live by. And that is the reason we are sponsoring this event. I think driving positive change within the community, so whether it's uh, Seattle Maharashtra Mandal, or for that matter, it's the Bengali uh, uh, Mitra Mandal. If it's Women in Technology Forum, I think we want to be in all these places and uh, to nurture and promote uh, talent within the community. Uh, interestingly, uh, just uh, last week, uh, Tech Mahindra uh, Forbes actually published a list <coughs> It's a global digital hundred list, and Tech Mahindra was ranked 15th on on that list. Uh, uh, and uh, so, Tech Mahindra is the highest ranked non-US company to be on that list, and the only IT services company uh, to be that ranked that high in the global hundred list. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we are driving the digital revolution and digital eco economy throughout the globe and we are serving the largest organizations in this region. Today uh, Tech Mahindra has grown to almost 1000 people in the Pacific Northwest and we are growing. Uh, we are driving the digital transformation for uh, biggies and big organizations of this region and beyond. And also the uh, Digital India Initiative which is run by the government of India. So the point is that we would want, we want to converse with all you guys, I want to have a conversation with all of you to introduce you to a refreshed Tech Mahindra and uh, see what we can do together and thrive in this community. So thank you, thanks a lot for that. Uh, going with what Karen said on nurturing thyself, we have some non-stress balls for all of you. So on your way out, just grab one and keep yourself stress free. Thank you. So we have Grishma Shinde from Hybro Systems. Thank you very much. Um, good evening folks. So I'm here to introduce you to one of the banners that we have up here on the table, uh, ta table Hybro LLC. We are a IT product and consulting firm. So what we do is we offer tech consulting, uh, IT staffing, and placement services. We also offer automation and um, other tech-related um, services. Uh, we are headquartered in, here in Bellevue, Washington. We also have other places in the nation, such as California, North Carolina, Texas, Arizona, and New York as well. We also create our own products, such as the GSA app, which is a goal setting app. Also under development, we have right now a biometric app for preschoolers. Um, we also have open positions here uh, around the world, um, around the nation basically, uh, where we have competitive wages and um, retirement plans and other benefits. So if you're interested, we have a table set up in the back, so please join us there. Please make sure to spend some time on all the booths uh, we have. Uh, also, we have Ajinkya Care is 
one of our executive committee members, he also has a table, he wrote a book on TypeScript, it's published, it's present on Amazon. So do stop by, take a look at the book, and uh, uh, uh. yeah, I think uh, I'm just trying to uh, go through the list of the things to be done. Uh, I think this is the last thing, and uh, we can start socializing now. Thank you.